move on the, the next speaker, the Professor Robert, Robert Poye. Uh, is an associate professor of inorganic chemistry at the University of Oxford and also a fellow of St. John's College. Uh, his group is now based on in electro uh, inorganic chemistry lab, and he has received uh, several awards, including Young Engineer of the Year Award by the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2018, Rising Star Award by the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology of Canada in 2020, and President's Award for Outstanding Early Career Researcher by Imperial College London in 2021. Uh, please uh, welcome the robot, Professor Robert Hoye. Right. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Robert and uh, we're now based in Oxford. Um, and in today's talk, I want to bring us back into the area of energy materials and uh, especially talk about recent work on developing a new generation of non-toxic uh, optoelectronic materials by utilizing these two concepts here on defect tolerance and uh, controlling cation disorder. Uh, so as mentioned, my group is now uh, based in Oxford. Uh, we've actually just very recently moved to Oxford. Um, a few months ago, we were previously based at Imperial College London, uh, where we were um, located for two and a half years. And before Imperial, we were previously based in Cambridge. So we've been moving around a bit, but we've now settled down in Oxford. And my group is a, a, a solid state chemistry group, but we're also highly interdisciplinary and we have people with backgrounds in material science, uh, physics, and engineering as well. And the scope of our research spans from the fundamentals to identify new concepts towards discovering new materials through to the processing of these compounds and their applications and devices. And uh, historically, we have been a, a photovoltaics group, but more recently, we've been branching out and exploring um, you know, other types of applications for the uh, materials that we've been working on. And that includes photoelectrochemical cells. So before I get into the presentation, I just wanted to thank uh, some of the funding sources from my side, especially the Royal Academy of Engineering and the European Research Council. And also like to thank the many different collaborators that we work with. So there's too many people to list for not one to one slide, but these are some of the main people I'd like to thank. Uh, especially like to thank Laura Hertz in Oxford for you know, working with us on the ultra-fast spectroscopy. Uh, as well as Aaron Walsh. So my group is an experimental group, but we've been have had have, have we've had had quite a uh, productive collaboration with Aaron Walsh's group on the computations uh, to take an interlinked experimental computational approach uh, towards materials development. And I mentioned that we are a, uh, historically a photovoltaics group, and more recently we've been working in collaboration with uh, Owen Ryson in Cambridge on uh, photoelectrochemical cells. Okay, so. Uh, you, know, you probably have heard from an earlier talk by Professor Kamert about the importance of uh, you know, um, you know, photovoltaics towards reaching net zero uh, by 2050, which is a goal that many countries are now adopting. And uh, you know, photo, in the photovoltaics industry right now, it is dominated uh, by silicon PV. And one of the core challenges with silicon is around the high capital intensity of manufacturing. In other words, the expensive equipment needs to manufacture silicon with high enough quality to be used in electronics. Um, and if you, for example, if you looked, were to look at a silicon manufacturing facility, it's a very clean environment with very quite expensive equipment that processes these materials at high temperatures in order to make single crystalline silicon with high quality. Now contrast that to the more recent material, lead Taylor perovskites, uh, this can be fabricated in much dirty environments using much simpler equipment, um, for example, by solution processing. And the temperature required to process these materials is a lot lower, so the thermal budget involved is a lot lower, and perovskite photovoltaics can have much lower uh, CO2 footprint. So the energy payback time for perovskite PV is just a couple, predictably just a couple of months, whereas for silicon PV is a couple of years. So uh, there's, there's quite a big difference, and um, perovskite PV have a lot of potential for making uh, quite very cost-effective uh, photovoltaics that may be uh, scalable uh, more quickly. Um, and I'm sure you heard 
about perovskites from the earlier talks um, and as well as from your own research, but just very briefly summarizing. So what I mean by perovskites are a family of compounds with this crystal structure here. And historically, uh, people have been focused on oxide-based perovskites. Uh, but over the past decade, uh, uh, there's been a new class of halide-based perovskites that have been shown to be extremely effective for photovoltaics. And these, it's these halide-based perovskites that I'm talking about. These have uh, lead cations coordinated octahedral with halides to form this cubic perovskite unit cell. And in the cuboctahedral vacancies, we have a large acyte cation. This can be an inorganic uh, cesium cation. It could be a, a large uh, alkyl ammonium cation. And if you look, have a look at this plot here, which correlates the efficiency against different band gaps. So the blue line is your, uh, your standard chocolate quasar limits uh, for different uh, semiconductor band gaps. And these other lines here represent different percentages of your rate of limit. So if, if you look at silicon, this has been developed for over four decades now, and it's now settled at efficiencies around the 75% of the rate of limit line. And contrast that with the perovskites. Um, these have only been developed for just over one decade, and yet they've already crossed this threshold. And they know the best perovskite devices are approaching the best efficiencies of single crystalline silicon PV. And one of the key requirements to reach this uh, high level performance is to have a, a very low rate of non rated recombination. So, for example, here's an equation that relates what the open circuit voltage, the highest voltage you get from a solar cell, how that relates to your the theoretical limit. And you can see that the relation depends on how high the external quantum efficiency is, which also depends on the photoluminescence quantum yields. Um, so you can see that for the VOC to approach a rate of limit, we need to have very high uh, EQEs approaching 100%. And indeed, um, perovskites make exceptionally good light emitting diodes as well. They're very good emitters as well. And that seems quite surprising, uh, given that the perovskites are made using much lower temperature, very simple processing groups, and have higher defect densities. Because historically, you would think that to get a low non rated recombination rate, you have to have, you have to get rid of the defects as much as possible. And that's certainly the case with traditional semiconductors like silicon where you need to manufacture these with uh, defect densities down to a very low value of about 10 to the 8 per centimeter cubed. And this is necessary in order for these to work in electronic devices, such as in these polycrystalline solar cells here. Uh, but with the lead halide perovskites, we have millions of times more defects than what you'll find in silicon. And yet in polycrystalline solar cells, you already can achieve a higher efficiency. So one of the reasons why this comes about is through a property called defect tolerance. And um, what you see on this slide is uh, electronic structure model to explain, uh, explain how defect tolerance may come about. So if we look at silicon, in silicon we have this uh, covalent structure and the sp hybrid orbitals from the silicon atoms, they hybridize in turn to form these bonding and antibonding states across the band gap. So as a first pass approximation, if you were to introduce a point defect such as a silicon vacancy, your dangly bonds will interfere to create defect states, and those defect states will approximately form close to where your original atomic orbitals were. In this case, these original orbitals are in the middle of the band gap, so you would tend to form deep trap states. And these deep traps are very harmful to the uh, performance, causing high rates of non-rated recombination. And the only way to get around that is to get rid of the defects as much as possible, which is why it's so important to process these at high temperatures and have very high purities. Now, contrast that to the perovskites, we have a very different electronic structure. And this time, the original atomic orbitals are, are close to the band, band edges rather than being in the middle of the band gap. So when you form point defects such as vacancies or interstitials, there's a much greater likelihood that your defect states will either be resonant within the valence band, or if they do form within the band gap, they're much more likely to be shallow rather than deep. And if you look at this shallow state here, it's very close in energy to your conduction band, so you can very easily capture an electron, but it's very far away in energy from your valence band. So the probability of also capturing a hole is a lot lower. And therefore, you can have a high density of these shallow states 
but still have a low non-race recombination rate. Hence, you get defect tolerance. Um, but as, as you, you know, or, or many of you know or are thinking about right now, the lead halo perovskite gets contained lead, and in particular, it's available in a highly uh, a, a soluble form, so it's very accessible in contrast to other lead-based compounds. And so a lot of people are concerned about the, the potential toxicity limitations of these materials. And, uh, um, and this has motivated many groups to identify alternative classes of materials that can replicate the exceptional performance of the perovskite, but overcome its toxicity and stability limitations. And in the broad field itself, there's been three main approaches to doing that. The first approach is through chemical analogy. So substituting out lead for other divalent cations like tin or germanium. The second approach has been to find structural analogs like double perovskites, other materials with a perovskite crystal structure. But the third approach and the approach that we've been taking most is to find electronic analogs. So not necessarily perovskite compounds, but materials that can replicate this particular electronic structure, which based off this model is important for achieving defect tolerance. Um, so we've been focusing in particular on bismuth-based compounds, and that's because bismuth is right next to lead on the periodic table. Bismuth forms a stable three plus oxidation state, which then means it has the same electronic configuration as lead cations. But in contrast to its neighbors, so bismuth, this is a poisonous corridor, over here you have uh, uh, toxic compounds, and over here you have radioactive compounds. In contrast with all its neighbors, bismuth is neither toxic nor is it radioactive. For example, you would use bismuth subsilicate in over-the-counter stomach medicine. You would use bismuth oxychloride for cosmetics. Uh, so potentially with bismuth-based compounds, we could find materials that not only could mimic the defect tolerance of the lead halo perovskites, but also overcome its toxicity limitations. So in this talk, I'll be covering some two of the recent materials that we've been uh, looking at. And the first material I want to talk about is bismuth oxyiodide. So this is not a material you have uh, thought about if you're just looking for a lead-free perovskite because it doesn't have a perovskite crystal structure and it's not chemically analogous to the perovskites either. But the reason why we're interested in this material is because it's electronically analogous. Um, you can see the crystal structure over here. It has a layered structure with five atoms throughout the cross section. And at the bent edges, it's mainly composed of bismuth and iodine states um, in a very similar way as what you will find in the lead halo perovskite. So it's electronically analogous. We made this material um, using chemical vapor deposition, which is a technique that would be used commercially. And uh, we, we grew these materials by evaporating bismuth iodide and reacting with oxygen gas to form bismuth oxyiodide thin films. So here you can see photographs of these films, and we kept these in ambient air for almost 200 days. And you can see that the phase remained exactly the same over this period of time. There's very little change in the visual appearance. This material is um, a lot more stable than uh, methamonium lead iodide perovskites in, in ambient air. And we next want to understand this defect tolerance. So to do this, we worked with a theory colleague based at the uh, US National Renewable Energy Lab. And what you see in this diagram is a summary of the defect calculations done on these materials. So these uh, states here represent the most common uh, point defects in this material that we found. And you can see that in three of the cases here, the, the uh, trap states are resonant within the bands. They don't form within the band gap. The only exception is this bismuth vacancy, which is shallow within the band gap. And this confirms the hypothesis we put forward and shows that bismuth oxyiodide is able to tolerate its most common vacancy in anti-site defects. So that was extremely promising. And the next one is to take it forward towards applications. So I'll be talking about two applications that we recently have been investigating with uh, bismuth oxyiodide. And the first of these applications is in photovoltaics. Um, so here's a summary of a recent roadmap that I was involved in uh, in the UK. And you can see here that although um, utility scale application of silicon of, of PV is the most common use of photovoltaics, it's not the only one. There's also some emerging markets which are becoming increasingly more important, such as in building integrated PV and in indoor photovoltaics. And you can see in particular that indoor photovoltaics is a rapidly growing uh, market area. 
So although crystalline silicon dominates the utility scale, it is not as um, advantageous in these other areas. And in fact, it can't really be used e efficiently in indoor PV. So this really opens up the possibility of developing new types of materials that can overcome some of the limitations of silicon for these other types of applications. So this is just to give you some illustration. So uh, the building integrated PV includes turning windows into uh, solar cells, semi-transparent solar cells, uh, as you can see here. And the reason why indoor PV is um, so important is it's important for powering Internet of Things electronics. And you saw from the previous presentation the idea of powering some um, small devices using piezoelectric uh, energy harvesting. But you can also harvest the energies of widely available indoors as well, um, using photovoltaics to power small devices. And the whole basis of the Internet of Things is around many different wireless sensors, which can all communicate with each other. And this, in a way, embeds intelligence into the infrastructure. And so having infrastructure that is fixed, you have infrastructure that can respond based off the changing requirements, such so as changing heating requirements or changing requirements in, in terms of attention. And this gives you smart homes, smart props, smart infrastructure. But for this to work, you have to have many of these small wireless sensors able to communicate over long distances. And that means you have to provide them with some power. Currently, the most common way in which you provide power to these small wireless sensors is by using batteries. As you all know, batteries last for a certain amount of time, and then they uh, run out. Um, so if you have a trillion of these Internet of Things devices, which may happen in the very near future, and you rely on batteries to power all of these trillion devices, then you'll be throwing away over 100 billion batteries. So that, that's you know, quite a significant sustainability problem. And if you can instead use photovoltaics to harvest the energy that's really available indoors, you can recharge these batteries or operate these devices battery free and therefore overcome this limitation. So we want to explore the possibility of using bismuth oxyiodide for uh, indoor photovoltaics. And here you can see the um, a device structure that we developed. So this is a, a PIN uh, device structure where we have a whole transport layer on the bottom, uh, transparent electrodes, and electron transport layer on top. And you can see that a challenge with this material is that the top surface is quite heavily textured. So we cannot simply solution process an electron transport layer on top. So to overcome this problem, we um, use a reactor that we've developed in the lab. So this is called a uh, spatial atomic layer deposition. And this replicates some of the properties of ALD type films, but in open air without requiring a vacuum. So we can use this to, in a way, print off oxide thin films and grow them conformally to conformally cover the textured top surface of bismuth oxide and therefore completely cover this top surface. And you can see here that these devices were successful. We got external quantum efficiencies reaching up to 80% of this blue wavelength of uh, 450 nanometers. And at the time that we published this work in 2017, that was the highest EQE for any bismuth oxide based photovoltaic device, as well as any other bismuth based compound. Of course, since then, the field has developed and there's other bismuth based photovoltaic materials that have also reached or exceeded 80% EQE. But this is quite an encouraging milestone uh, at that time. At the same time, though, you can see that the EQE doesn't start to rise until we get to the visible wavelength range. And that's because bismuth oxide has quite a wide band gap. If you think earlier to the photographs I showed you, this material has a red appearance. And that's because uh, it absorbs in the green wavelength range uh, due to this wide band gap. So this is too wide for outdoor solar, but it's ideal for indoor light harvesting. So here you can see a comparison of the spectra that you get outdoors with one sun versus uh, what you get with common indoor light sources like white light LEDs or fluorescent tubes. And you can see that indoor light sources are much more narrowly distributed just over the visible wavelength range. And in fact, a bang of 1.9 EV is the ideal bang for harvesting this visible light. So you can see here that uh, just by taking a bismuth oxide at indoor PV, uh, in, uh, sorry, uh, under indoor lighting, the power conversion efficiencies increase by a factor of five. So these values that we reached in this first demonstration are comparable with what you will find in hydrogenated amorphous silicon. So if you used a calculator with a solar cell built into it, 
that is amorphous silicon. Um, so that's a state of the art for end all PV right now. And it's quite promising that this first demo could already match the current commercial standards for uh, indoor PV. And I should mention that the devices we started with were around the median of the power conversion efficiencies that we've achieved with bismuth oxyiodide. So the best PC under one sun is about 2% rather than 1%. So already just working within the existing parameter space, we could already achieve performances well within the range of uh, amorphous silicon PV. And here we show that we could use these indoor photovoltaics to power uh, carbon nanotube-based inverters. So you can see that we have a high input, we get a low output, and vice versa. And this demonstrates that we could already use these devices to power some of the electronics you may find in Internet of Things devices. And we next ask, ask ourselves, although this is a promising first demonstration, what's the future potential for bismuth oxyiodide under indoor lighting? So what we did here was we calculated um, the spectroscopic limited maximum efficiency. And this is the maximum efficiency you might expect from a material based off its optical absorption spectrum. So if all the light absorbed becomes electron holes that are then all extracted, this tells you what the maximum efficiency you may expect would be. So in this plot here, you can see the solar lines as being the ratio of limits under fluorescent or white light LED lighting. And this is based off calculated based off real uh, spectra from these different light sources. And you can see that with bismuth oxyiodide, you could reach over 40% efficiency if you have a fully optimized uh, device. Um, and that's really quite promising. It substantially exceeds amorphous silicon um, and is comparable to what you, you would get with lead halo perovskite indoor photovoltaics. And we also looked at the wider family of bismuth and antimony-based perovskite inspired materials and we found that there were some even more promising compounds, such as the silver bismuth iodide ratifiance, that could, in, in principle, reach uh, up to 56% efficiency. So what this tells us is that for indoor, P, indoor photovoltaics, um, we should be um, focusing on this new class of materials for this application. And it also tells us that although in the past, people have been exploring um, perovskite-inspired materials mostly for outdoor solar, potentially indoor PV is a much more promising application for these wide band gap materials that uh, people should be putting more efforts into. So that was the first application. And I now want to talk about the second application with bismuth oxyiodide. Um, and this is with hydrogen production. So as you all know, um, green hydrogen is uh, considered to be an important source of, of energy um, to help us to reach net zero by 2050. Um, and you can see from this plot from the International Energy Agency that the world's demand for hydrogen is always increasing, and probably this will increase faster in the future. At the same time, we have to think about where this hydrogen is coming from. You see that the majority of the hydrogen is coming from these blue regions here, and that's from the refining of steam or from the cracking of ammonia, which are high temperature processes, which involve a lot of uh, CO2 emissions. So in fact, the world's CO2 uh, was uh, the CO2 footprint of the world's hydrogen industry accounts for 830 million tons. So to put this number into context, that's the same amount of CO2 emitted by the whole of the UK plus Indonesia combined. Uh, so it's very important that we develop more renewable sources of producing hydrogen. So one of those options is uh, by using photoelectrochemical cells, which are semiconductive devices that have a sunlight to then split water to form green hydrogen. Bismuth oxide has been proposed before uh, for water splitting, but it was ruled out for two reasons. The first reason was people thought it didn't have the right band positions, and that was based off cyclopotametry measurements. The second reason is because people found it to degrade in, in uh, uh, electrolytes. So we want to revisit the potential of bismuth oxyiodide. And this work was led by uh, both my group and uh, the Reisner groups, and in particular, these two people here were the ones who uh, worked together to lead this uh, joint collaborative work. So first of all, I um, want to ask, does this material have the right band position for water splitting? So here you can see we remeasured the band positions of bismuth oxyiodide using um, photo emission spectroscopy. And this was based off our photovoltaic device structure. And you can see that the electron frequency is actually low enough to reduce protons to form hydrogen. And for the next question of stability, we want to take over some of the learnings from photovoltaics into the photoelectrochemical fields. Historically, people in the PEC field would put the semiconductor in direct contact with the electrolytes, 
But now we want to explore whether using the contact layers, which are quite common for PV, and but not so common for PECs, whether this could improve stability. So here we use the inorganic device structure that we've developed for photovoltaics. And we combine that with uh, a graphite epoxy um, a paste in order to um, further encapsulate these devices. So here you can see that although previous reports um, only reported the devices to last for just two minutes, with this uh, more advanced device structure that we developed, we, we can see that these devices lasted for a couple of months rather than a couple of minutes. So this is quite a, really quite a promising improvement in stability. And in fact, you can see that the main degradation in the photocurrent comes from the catalyst rather than the absorber. So when we replenish the catalyst and these uh, gray regions here, uh, we get a, 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 a you know, an increase increase again uh, in the photocurrents. Um, and this is this is quite promising that the absorber is more stable than the catalyst. Usually it's the other way around with novel materials. Another uh, development that we made here was around how we make large area uh, photoelectrodes. The way historically people have made large area photoelectrodes by is the same as the way people make large area PV devices, which is to just make one pixel with a large area. But with photoelectric chemistry, the um, situation is a bit different because you, you want to, you don't necessarily need to have just one pixel. You just need to provide a surface with electrons available for reduction reactions. So in, in, in the lab, it was quite common to make PV devices using this multi-pixel small area device structure. So here we explore the idea of uh, making, adding together multiple of these small area pixels to make overall a large area and whether this can lead to better performance. So here we made a PV device first, and then we screened through those based off the um, VOCs. And we blocked out the bad pixels using epoxy, leaving behind just the good pixels. And with this concept, we could get a larger overall area than if we try to make just a single large pixel. So over here, you can see the IV curves for uh, the different area devices. And as you might expect in PV devices, the small area device works better, has better VOC and higher short circuit current density. Um, and this translates into PEC performance. So the light purple curves, that is from adding together seven of these small area devices. And the total area from this is larger than a large area device. And yet we still overall have a better performance with a larger early onset potential of uh, reduction. And this led to a, a higher Faraday yield as well a higher rate of hydrogen evolution. Um, and the advantage here is because we have a larger um, early onset potential, we now have a better overlap with bismuth vanadate photoanodes. So these, by combining together the photocathode and the photoanodes, we have a region here where these, de these two devices can then uh, uh, sustain each other. So here, here's, this is a, 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 a tandem device where we combine these two electrodes. Um, and here you, you can see that with zero volts bias applied, we can still get a photocurrent just by shining light onto these devices without applying any external bias or any power input. So in a way, you can consider these to be acting like artificial leaves, where instead of harvesting sunlight to produce sugars like a plant leaf would, we're harvesting sunlight to produce hydrogen and oxygen fuels. And here you can see the um, uh, self-driven uh, photocurrent from these devices, you can see is stable over hundreds of hours. And the photocurrent is larger where we're using, adding together multiple small pixels than trying to use one large area pixel. And we want to extend this concept further. So we replace a platinum catalyst with this dendritic copper indium catalyst. And this dend dendritic uh, copper indium catalyst allows us to also reduce CO2 as well as reduce uh, protons. So we could form a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And the reason we want to do that is because this is um, called synthesis gas, which is an important precursor for making uh, methanol as well as other value added hydrocarbons. And here you can see we can achieve um, self-driven uh, syngas production using our photoelectric chemical tandem. And this was the first time that an oxide-based photoelectric tandem, photoelectrochemical tandem could achieve bias-free syngas production. So that was quite an exciting development. And I also just want to emphasize that this device structure that we've developed is also widely applicable towards other novel materials as well. So this is a recent work that was also a collaboration with the Reisner Group. Uh, this work was led by the Reisner Group. And here we combined you know, perovskite photocathodes 
with bismuth nanodate photoanodes into a large area. And here you can see that uh, we could, um, you know, develop, because these are low temperature process materials, they can be deposited onto lightweight plastic or uh, titanium foil substrates. And by reducing the mass with these lighter substrate, we could get these tandem devices to float. And here you can see these tandem devices floating on the river cam in Cambridge. Um, and this, so this is literally acting like an artificial leaf. Um, and the reason these could work despite the uh, water solubility and instability of the perovskite is because to a large extent, we're using the graphite epoxy paste to protect this material from moisture. Okay, so my main key message from this first section is that bismuth oxide is an air-stable material. We've shown it to be tolerant towards uh, the main vacancy anti-site defects and also is an effective visible light harvester. So has quite promising applications for uh, solar fuels as well as for indoor light harvesting to power the internet of things. And with that, I just want to go into the second section. So this is another recent material that we worked on, uh, sodium bismuth sulfide. Um, a lot of the people working on perovskite inspired materials have been focused on halides. And that's mostly because we started with lead halide perovskite, so people have been looking at alternative halides. But there's no particular reason why we should only be focused on halides. And, um, and indeed, it's quite important that we you know, broaden the class of the materials that we explore. So, um, and uh, chalcogenides are quite promising. Um, in general, chalcogenides are more stable than halides. And this is a recent paper published earlier this year showing that one of these chalcogenides, silver bismuth sulfides, could achieve uh, power conversion efficiencies certified at uh, 9%. So that's the highest power conversion efficiency for bismuth-based uh, photovoltaic compounds. So we want to explore the related compounds, sodium bismuth sulfides. And the reasons for doing that is first of all, because um, sodium is uh, non-toxic, it's widely abundant. You will find it in table salt, for example, where silver cations could be toxic if they're present um, in, in aqueous solutions in the ionized form. But also another reason that sodium is expected to just act as a spectator ion. And we expect then that sodium bismuth sulfide would have uh, band edge orbitals, which are qualitatively quite si more similar to what you find in lead halide perovskites. And this is especially important for us, considering that we're looking for electronic analogs to these perovskites. Plus is the fact that sodium and bismuth have very similar ionic radii. So instead of having uh, a structure where you have sodium and bismuth on different ladder sites. Here they actually occupy the same ladder site and you get something called cation disorder, uh, which then gives you a higher symmetry crystal structure. And that's quite a lot different to many other bismuth-based compounds which have uh, low structural dimensionality. So uh, this work was a collaborative work led by uh, um, my, one of my students from my group, as well as um, Sean Kavana from David Scanlon and Aaron Walsh's group who performed the calculations. So this was a um, joint experimental computational efforts. Uh, first of all, we looked at the stability. So we synthesized this material as nanocrystals. And you can tune the size of the nanocrystals through the synthesis temperature. And here you can see that this material remains phase stable for at least 112 days. And in fact, my student remeasured the uh, diffraction pattern after 11 months in air, and we found the material to remain ex exactly the same. So this, is, this material is stable for at least 11 months in air, which is really quite remarkable. But what's more interesting is that this material has very strong light absorption. So over here, you can see the absorption coefficient spectra for a range of established inorganic compounds. Um, but if you look at sodium bismuth sulfide, which is a blue line here, you can see that with this compound, we have much higher alpha values. And in fact, at this band gap of 1.4 electron volts, we can already achieve a very high absorption coefficient greater than 10 to the 5 per centimeter. And what this means is that with just 30 nanometers of this material, you could, in principle, achieve an efficiency up to 26% in the fully optimized device. So this means that you could potentially achieve efficiencies comparable with uh, silicon, but using 10,000 times less material. And that's especially important if you want to uh, consider space applications, for example, space photovoltaics for satellites. So we want to understand why the absorption coefficients are so high in this material and what we can learn and apply towards other materials. So here you can see the E versus K calculation for this compound. Um, and the first thing we learn is that the, the, the valence band maximum and the conduction band minimum are very close together 
in terms of its uh, key points. Um, so that's why we call the pseudo direct banger, where the difference between the first direct transition and the indirect banger is just 0.01 electron volts. So that's that's the first thing. Another important thing is that the density of states is, is concentrated much more closely in the Venus band and the sodium-based compounds than the silver-based compounds. And this means they have much more states available in the upper Venus band to take part in photon absorption um, um, processes. And we can rationalize that based on these simple um, molecular orbital diagrams. And the sodium-based compounds, sodium acts as a spectator ion, doesn't take part in uh, the band edges, um, the orbitals at the band edges. So we mainly have hybridization between the sulfur 3p states and the bismuth 6s states. And because these two states are relatively far away from each other in energy, uh, we have a small splitting between the bonding and antibonding states in the Venus band. And hence, we have a high concentration of states in the Venus band. Whereas in the silver based compounds, it's the silver that dominates interactions with the sulfur. So, and because they're closer in energy, we have a much wider splitting, therefore, a much wider distribution of states uh, in, in the uh, upper Venus band. And therefore, we have a lower absorption coefficient in the silver based compound. Now, if you look at this E versus K diagram, you'll notice something quite interesting. You notice some notice that we have these states forming within the band span itself. And we found that these states occur where you have a high coordination of sodiums around the sulfates. So if you remember, I called this compound cation disorder, which means sodium and bismuth both occupy the same letter site. But that distribution of these two cations is not the same. And that's because it's di uh, driven by kinetics. We have a random or random uh, distribution of sodium and bismuth. And so we have some situations where some sulfurs have a lot of sodiums coordinating around it. And when that happens, then we have these sulfur, these P states forming within the valence band, as you can see over here. Um, and that is quite consequential. And we know this happens based on the optical absorption spectra. So here we measured the absorption coefficients to very high precision below the band gap using a technique called photothermal deflection spectroscopy. And you'll see that we have these, this little bump here at 1 eV. And we saw from our calculations that if your band gap is over here at 1.4 eV, then these localized states, these states of form due to the sulfur P states will also form at 1 eV. So this is experimental evidence that this, uh, we, we get these states forming. And that they're, they have, uh, they're quite consequential in terms of the charge carry properties. So we measure the charge carry um, properties of this material using uh, transient absorption spectroscopy. So if you're not familiar with the technique, a very simple way of thinking about what this does is that it measures the absorption spectrum with picosecond time resolution. And by doing that, you can track the, uh, the decay in further generated charge carriers. So a positive signal here means that you have charge carriers in your conduction band. Um, so you get, we get these uh, peaks over here uh, at around where we have our uh, optical absorption onset. And we can monitor how this decays to monitor the decay in the excited charge carriers. And what was really quite surprising was that there's a very slow decay. If you were to fit a lifetime to this data, you'll get a lifetime over 10 microseconds. And that, that is a lot longer than what you would get in the lead halo perovskites, as well as other inorganic compounds. So this was quite surprising. Once you understand this a bit more in detail. So we then measured um, the, the, the decay, uh, what happened to the mobile carriers. And we did that by monitoring the uh, transient photoconductivity. And this was measured by uh, Laura Hertz's group in Oxford using a technique called optical pump terahertz probe spectroscopy. And using that, this technique, you can see that we have a very fast decay in the mobile carriers. Initially, we have delocalized carriers with a reasonable mobility of 0.3 semi squared per volt second. But then within a picosecond, we have these carriers decaying. And then, then we get this localized state with a mobility of only 0.03 semi squared per volt second. So this rapid localization is too fast to be due to trapping due to defects. It's much more likely to be due to process called carrier localization, which is when charge carriers cover to the phonons and the lattice to form uh, localized states. In other words, where the electron wave function is localized within a unit cell. And then in order for these charge carriers to move, they have to move by hopping between different states. So this can happen if you have very strong coupling towards large uh, uh, towards uh, optical phonons, or you have coupling towards uh, um, acoustic phonons. So to test what's, so understand a bit more about what's happening, 
uh, we calculated the Froelich coupling constant, so the coupling constant describing coupling between electrons and longitudinal optical phonons. And we found that the coupling constant was in the intermediate range. So it wasn't low, but it wasn't so high that we would expect carrier localization either. And in fact, these uh, coupling constants are similar to what you would get in the lead halo perovskites. And we, we know that there's no carrier localization in the perovskites. So this is probably not the case, not what's causing the carrier localization. Well, next, to look into the um, uh, small polarons, what we did here was we investigated this computationally. We introduced either electron or a hole and then relaxed the lattice to see where the electron hole went to. And what we found here was that the holes all were localized around the sulfurs with a high coordination of, um, of sodium. If you think back to what I said to you just earlier, when there's high coordination of sodium, that means that we have these states, sulfur p states forming within the band gap close to the band band. So probably what's happening is that those, uh, lo those localized states are trapping the holes very soon after photo excitation. And then after trapping the holes, the light has distorts around that to form a small polaron that's then very hard to move between different states. On the other hand, the electrons uh, cluster around the bismuth. Um, so this explains why we don't see any PL from this material because the holes in electrons hardly ever see each other. And also explains why in the long time scale, we see such a very slow decay in the uh, photo generated carrier population because it's very difficult for these electron holes to find a common defect state for them to recombine with each other. So the key messages here, um, you know, sodium bismuth is a very intriguing solar absorber, has very strong optical absorption coefficients um, with a quite an ideal band gap for solar energy harvesting. It's very stable in air, very stable for over 11, 11 months, and it has this property called cation disorder, which um, can lead to localized solar p states that then strongly influence uh, charged carrier transport through carrier localization. And this emphasizes the carrier localization important property that more people should be investigating in the early stage exploration of novel uh, solar absorbers. So I just want to summarize my talk. So in the early part of my talk, I um, put forth the idea that bismuth oxyiodide, as well as many other bismuth and antimony based perovskite and spy materials have a lot of potential for indoor light harvesting because there are wide band gaps closer to UV is ideal for harvesting visible light indoors. And this is important to power into things electronics. I also show you that bismuth oxyiodide is a promising uh, photocathode material with suitable properties for water splitting as well as for uh, CO2 reduction. And I showed you that we were able to demonstrate the first oxide based photoelectrical tandem that could achieve bias free syngas production. And in the last part of the talk, I uh, talked to you about sodium bismuth sulfide and uh, in particular the higher optical absorption coefficient we get with the material, but also carrier localization. But at the same time, even though we have charged carrier localization, the diffusion lengths we can achieve are still uh, about 100 nanometers, which is greater than the thickness needed in order to absorb sufficient light. So potentially sodium bismuth sulfide could still work as an effective solar uh, energy harvester. Um, so with that, I'd like to just thank you for uh, your attention and be very glad to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for very impressive and uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, now time is open for question. Then Professor Robert Hoe, so, so you can refer the Q&A. Okay, so let me read the first question. Uh, similar to the non-toxic bismuth lipolase, so toxic lead, and has similar performance. Uh, there are many efforts to find the alternatives in applications using toxic atoms. In this year perspective, how to find the alternatives with a similar performance in other application? Right. So uh, I, I, I think I understand from this question that in addition to bismuth-based compounds, you also there's also been a lot of efforts with lead-based compounds and cadmium-based compounds. I, I hope that's what I understand by this question. Um, I mean, and, and indeed, it's true. I mean, with these. Um, your toxic-based elements like lead, cadmium, and uh, thallium, they're very ideal properties for optoelectronics, but unfortunately, it's, they're toxic. And if you want to use them for applications, um, especially in consumer electronics, for example, in the Internet of Things, then uh, there are regulations that prohibit you from, from doing this. Of course, there are some applications like outdoor solar or maybe even radiation detectors where this, these will be permitted, but uh, it won't be the case in all uh, cases. So that, that really strongly motivates um, you know, finding materials with 
non-toxic, which, which are non-toxic. And in terms of, um, you know, in terms of how, you know, how, our strategies towards finding these materials. So I showed you earlier in the talk, um, the, the, this the, um, model that people have developed for uh, defect tolerance. And this is one approach that uh, myself and other colleagues have taken, which is to um, use these design rules for defect tolerance to guide our search. So for example, th this would, you know, inform us that we need to find compounds with um, base of heavy, which have stable bands S2 electrons, which can hybridize with anions in a very similar way to what you find in the perovskites. And of course, more recently, there's been other design rules developed, such as based off crystal structure and your know, lattice parameter, which help us to refine the search. But I want to emphasize that you know, the understanding of what gives rise to defect tolerance is not complete yet. And it's very important that we ex experimentalists work together with theorists to develop a more complete understanding of defect tolerance, which can then help us to better refine the vast material space and pinpoints the most promising material. So I think that is what's really important in the future. And in addition to uh, defect tolerance, I showed you in the latter half of the talk about the importance of considering cation, um, sorry, of considering carrier localization. Um, because, you know, historically it's just been assumed that you have a very long lifetime that's good for so absorbers. But here we show that it's not necessarily the case if you're dominated by carrier localization. And, you know, this is a process that uh, isn't so well understood so far. So I think it's also very important that we develop new fundamental insights into you know, what design principles, what chemical descriptors allow us to identify whether materials will undergo carrier localization or not in order to help us to design materials that can avoid this property. So I think in the future, we need to find the intersection between defect tolerance and de delocalized charge carriers. Okay, thank you. And the next question, the, thank you for the wonderful talk, Professor Hoye. Uh, you have been leaching, uh, researching the synthesis of a mixed the cation perovskite to improve physical property and thermal and structural stability. I wonder if the concept of high entropy can be applied and what you think. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And especially if we think about um, this, you know, um, what I talked in the latter half about cation disorder. So if we have just base of entropy, then this would favor us to have a complete, you know, perfect alternation between sodium and bismuth, because that's what maximizes the local entropy. And if we had that, then we could avoid these um, localized sulfur P states. So if we could find growth scenarios in which you know, entropy can play a strong role, then that can allow us to Im improve this, improve the homogeneity of cation disorder, which can improve these optoelectronic properties. So I think, you know, especially for these emerging cation disorder compounds, this is an extremely important concept to push forward. Thank you. And next question, can the conventional strategy in analogous uh, the perovskite system, such as doping, alloying different uh, cations and the surface functionalization be applied in this space material to further modulate their performance? Absolutely. So, um, you know, um, you know with, with the lead halo perovskite, one of the strengths is that you can finely tune the properties of a wide range through composition and you can do exactly the same with bismuth based compounds so for example you know with bismuth oxyiodide you can tune the band gap by changing the halide from iodine to bromine to chlorine um, and similarly you know for surface defects you can you can passivate those using very similar um you know uh, passivating agents as what has been developed with the lead halide perovskites because the, uh, the electronic and chemical environments are very similar between these bismuth and lead based compounds Okay, then uh, my the last question, uh, you uh, show the sodium bismuth uh, sulfide, right? Then uh, mm -hmm. which uh, synthetic method do you use? And also, is there any size effect on this crystal? Mm. Uh, yeah, great question. So we synthesize sodium bismuth sulfide uh, as nanocrystals. And that's because um, using other methods, very difficult to get the, to get the sodium to incorporate. So uh, what we did here was we used sodium hydride as our sodium precursor, uh, and we mixed that together with the bismuth and sulfur sources. And that was a method that worked quite well because of the high reactivity of the sodium hydride. Um, so, and uh, sorry, can you re repeat the latter half of the talk? Of the, uh, oh, the, sorry, are there, are there size, size effects? Effect, yes. Yeah. 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 So um, we haven't found there to be size effects. So we uh, we can tune the size through the synthesis temperature. So we can tune the size from four nanometers to 15 nanometers or larger. And we haven't seen 
well, we haven't seen a significant change in the optical band, band of, of the optical band gap. And also, um, we've you know, measured the uh, external binding energy through uh, optical measurements, and we compare that with our calculations. And the external binding energy is very low; it's below twenty MeV. So that would suggest to us that even though we have a small size of four nanometers, we uh, we, we we avoid the formation of excitons uh, in the system. So, but perhaps if you were to reduce the size further, maybe then you have an exciton dominated system. I see. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the uh, Professor uh, Robert Hoye.